nerding out a little bit right now because I think you might even love selling more than I do. So this is going to be so much fun. Thank you so much for coming on the show. <laughs> it is absolutely my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And yes, shocking myself to death in my former iterations, yeah. I may also agree that I love selling more than you do. Yeah. I can, I can feel it. So this episode is especially for any coach who has a client getting goal and the idea of selling feels like an obstacle for you. So grab a pen and paper, get ready to take notes. We are going to spill the tea today. Yes, we are. Let's dive in. I just want to start. I want to hear your story, but I thought it might be fun to just talk about what generally accepted rule or process around selling does not actually apply in 2022? Uh, stale sales scripts need to die. <laughs> and honestly, uh -huh. if I'm being real bold, maybe the sales script entirely. Tell needs me more. To die. Yes, tell me more. Uh, Okay, so those of us who ever had to sell something for someone else, mm -hmm. going all the way back to childhood when you had to sell like wrapping paper or Girl Scout cookies door to door, yeah. they say, okay, Dallas, your sound bite is, are you interested in helping St. Mary's School by purchasing this high quality wrapping paper? And they say yes, or they say no. And then you go to the next house and you say, excuse me. Yep. Are you interested in supporting St. Mary's School through the purchase of this high quality wrapping paper? Okay, fine. It gets the points across. It establishes your exposition. Okay. But beyond that opening line, or maybe a couple of touch points that are so important for you to nail, the sales script robs us of both presence in the moment and individuality. Mm -hmm. And even if we write our own sales script, we rob ourselves of individuality because we're not giving ourselves permission to respond in the moment. And if we're not responding in the moment, are we really talking to the heart and soul of that client? Are we really showing that we can solve a problem when what we're feeding them is a packaged formulaic spiel that we've given between one and seven billion times? That's why yep. I say in 2022, no more sales scripts. Processes, yes. Scripts, yep. no. Yeah. And maybe even a checklist. Right? Yes. Yeah. Give yourself an outline. I am pro outline. Yeah. Right. I if agree if you more. feel like you're going to wander off, if you have ADD or ADHD or you get nervous and over talk, as so many people do, that's okay. Give yourself an outline. Like I said, put the landmarks on there so you know ah, I have to talk about the fact that I'm partnered with such and such organization, or I really want to make sure I handle this objection up front. Great. Awesome. Put it on your outline. But if yeah. I came on this podcast today and you asked me that really wonderful, thoughtful question, and rather than answer it, I did my best to retrofit a piece of my spiel, this episode would already be off the rails. Yep. Completely. And I want to just underscore your point here because as coaches, one of our greatest skills is listening. And so the script just takes you out of listening, which hurts the sale and all of these other pieces, but it also is an inaccurate experience for the client. It alienates the client. Yeah. And the thing is, it doesn't actively alienate. We're used to this. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I know, although it's a little bit different now that I teach sales, but let's say yeah, a right. couple of years ago before I did when I was still teaching marketing, mm -hmm. when I would get onto a situation where I know that the potential for being sales sold to is high, whether or not it's a designated sales call or discovery call or consultation, mm -hmm. any situation, including networking, where I felt like I was about to get sold to, I would basically lean back, put on my seatbelt, and wait to be word vomited on, and hope I can get a word in edgewise before they guilt me into making a decision. Yeah. What? And I didn't even think about how weird and how awkward that is until I go, well, why do I hate selling or what I thought was selling? And the answer was, I hate being sold to. Yeah. And why do I hate being sold to? Because I hate being word vomited on. Yep. 
So if we yeah. take that component out of it, we up the listening to your point, which I could not possibly agree with more than I do. If we up that listening, not only does the client feel seen, safe, and supported, which is my version of no like trust, mm -hmm. beyond that, they also have room to breathe, room to think, and the opportunity to ask the questions that matter to them. Yeah. So what I've been told with this scriptless but process heavy approach is that it's actually very comforting and liberating. Yeah. I've literally heard the word liberating from my clients and my clients clients yeah. when they are given the opportunity to rest into the conversation. Yep. Oh my goodness. Yes. And that's a wrap on this episode. Thank you everyone. Goodbye for listening. everyone. <laughs> Go make money and remember selling is coaching and coaching is selling. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So all my heart centered coaches out there who love being in the moment and you're so good at being present. Yes. Annie did not just give you license to show up to your sales conversations unprepared because we could take this too far, right? Uh -uh. So you, oh, we could take this so far. Yeah. So you said process, process. right? And so you're just drawing the distinction between having a yes. script and not listening and just following by rote and yes. being present, but also following a process so that you can serve the client by presenting an offer. Oh, absolutely. Because okay. all of us, every single coach on the planet, myself most certainly included, has gotten on a call where we have really good instant rapport with the person mm -hmm. and it's supposed to be a 20 minute sales call and it turns into two hours of free coaching. Yeah. Oh, right. Every single coach on the planet has done this mm -hmm. arguably more than once. And you know what? Sometimes if someone comes to you in distress and you don't feel like they're a good client for you and you don't want to ethically sell to them because they don't seem like a good fit and you want to spend a little time on them pro bono, that's fine as long as you're doing it purposefully and within your boundaries of generosity. Yeah. But what we're talking about about this process to your point is absolutely what i am not saying oh my goodness i am not saying i will drive to your house and beg you to think that i'm not saying this is get onto these calls without a plan yeah great great all Our right plan so, is mm -hmm. let them ask their questions about you you make sure you ask your relevant questions about them create a safe environment to figure out mutual fit. That is the goal of every single call. And you can't do that without understanding how you're probably gonna get from point A to point B. So as long as you're going to make sure that you're answering questions, that you're asking good questions, that you're actually listening to those answers and that you are going to make an offer when an offer seems right, then you won't leave the call going, I just gave away all my best stuff for free. I'm completely exhausted. I need to lay down. And then that person turns around and goes, wow, Dallas was so amazingly generous. I never have to hire her. Yes. Thank you. Yes. All right. So you have not always been someone so in love with selling. Oh, hells no. So can, I think it would be really valuable for our listeners to hear a little bit about your journey, but mm -hmm. what I'm most interested in is when the thing clicked for you, because you've even, it's on your website where mm -hmm. you used to be the most sales avoidant coach there was. So yes. what happened to take you from sales avoidant to being this expert who now guests on people's podcasts preaching about the power of selling? Honestly, I would love to say that it was some profound epiphany in me, mm -hmm. but what it was in me was like this lurking dread of watching my business slowly die. And it was not until I looked at my clients who I love so deeply and are so brilliant and so driven and so passionate and were doing everything I told them to do in the marketing and branding lane, because that was my old lane. Yeah. They were doing everything. They were showing up. They were being brave. They were being bold. They were writing great content, right? They had beautiful funnels. They had no money, none. And because of that, they weren't reinvesting in me because they couldn't afford to. They wanted to, but they couldn't afford to. And so I thought, why are no one, why is no one around me making any money? This mm -hmm. is messed up. There are people out there killing it in the same game as my people. And my people have more talent, more heart and more skill what is the problem here and the problem was none of us were asking for the sale 
right. none of us. And I had to see it in them first. Mm, and yeah. then it's kind of embarrassing. Honestly, Dallas, I looked at them and I was like, ugh, I got to get my people asking for money. Why aren't my people asking for money? The reason my people weren't asking for money is they were modeling me and I wasn't asking for and anything. You weren't asking for money. I wasn't asking for anything. I had no boundaries, mm -hmm. none. I had no selling skill or idea of selling skill. I had only the modeling of ways that I've been sold to and know that I didn't want to do that. So I didn't do anything. Yeah. Right. But marketing and sales are not the same department in any large business. Mm -hmm. I was making them the same department in mine. They're not. And yeah. so when I woke up to the fact, first and foremost, my clients were not getting to where they should be. Then I went into problem solver mode, which has always been my favorite mode. But I realized the problem wasn't just on their plate. The problem originated on my plate. They mm -hmm. were modeling me. And so that actually, as mortifying and horrifying and humiliating as that really was, it was a really big turning point in my business because I went to my client and said, listen, you know that I have tried to show up for you in the best possible way I can, but I have just been awakened to a huge way I was failing you. Please allow me to fix it. And I brought back a bunch of people that had been my marketing clients and I taught them how to sell for free because at that point I was still just testing the material yeah. to see if yeah. I was any good at it. And it turned out that it solved the problem for me. It solved the problem for them. And I thought, you know what? There's a million beautiful marketing coaches out there. There's a million beautiful branding strategists out there. I'm going to give up my real estate in that lane and go over to this one where people aren't really being told that they can sell with full integrity in keeping with their personality and not have to ever violate themselves or the person on the other end of the transaction. So now it's so important to me. It's all I do. Yeah. You know what's so cool about that? I wonder, you're so committed to serving others, right? And your very values aligned. You lead with your values. I wonder if your clients weren't having that problem, mm -hmm. if you, like, how long you would have lived as a sales avoidant person if you weren't first able to see it in your clients and really driven to solve the problem for them. Well, let's be real. Yeah. I would have I would have persisted in my sales avoidance until it put me out of business. Yeah. Yeah. Which it damn near did several times. Yeah. So how long I would have been able to keep going as a sales avoidant person is not as long as I would like to think because I wouldn't have had a business to be sales avoidant within. Yeah. Good point. Let's define sales avoidance just cool. for everybody listening. What does that mean to you? Sales avoidance is what we when colloquially people say to me i'm allergic to sales mm -hmm. sales feels icky slimy gross nasty i don't want to be a used car salesman right so it's kind of hard to define based on on the feeling itself because it ranges from person to person but what it is is you're in this great environment and you're marketing or selling or you're standing strong in your branding that it comes time to offer someone something and you feel that energetic shift in you that goes and now i must sell oh god no yeah. that's how sales avoidance shows up it's the yeah. nervousness it's the hesitation or the downright disgust that comes when it's time for you to put a price on your products and services and command that price yeah really clear really clear you know what this brings up because a lot of coaches in my audience definitely fall into the sales avoidance category mm -hmm. and what i hear a lot is this belief or this fear around manipulation. Like, I don't want to manipulate people. Yeah. So then coaches go too far into this other direction of, let me just serve the hell out of people and I will give so much or I will impress people so much that then they will automatically just ask for more. So what's your take on, like, how do you respond when people tell you they don't want to manipulate? Well, first things first, let me talk to the second half of that really quickly, yeah, sure. which is if you're being over generous, Mm -hmm. which is defined by you. If you're being super generous, maybe you're not ready to claim over, but if you're being super generous and you don't tell the client, the client doesn't know you're being generous. The client will not reward that generosity. They won't come back to you. Very quick story. I did a podcast with a really fabulous coach, um, but she also represents her family business and her family business fulfills um deliveries for food and breakfast type stuff to all of these offices covid 
no offices, mm -hmm. no deliveries. Mm -hmm. Now, they were renting things in those offices that their clients were using, and they wanted to be generous, so they thought, our clients are struggling, we're, we're struggling, we're gonna eat the cost on the machines that they have in there in that rental. But they never told the business that they were doing that. I'm not saying, look at us, we're the company of the year, oh my gosh, how lovely were your COVID saviors. I'm not saying do that. Yep. But when it came time for those clients to re-up, they said, thanks so much. We really appreciated that you didn't charge us all these months, but we're not going back to the office or maybe we're going back light and so we just don't need you. Thanks so much. And I told her on her own show, I said, listen, <laughs> if you would have said, we're going to eat this cost for you because we care about you, they would have re-enrolled. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. if you just mention it right so that's yeah. that's that first part but in terms of manipulation so there's there's my caveat on generosity right first and foremost i want to speak to that before yes. you move on because yes. this doesn't just apply to selling everyone any there will be times as a coach where the aligned action to take is to break your own rules for yes. example uh, you're in the middle of a coaching session and you know you're going to run over mm -hmm. if you don't narrate what's happening guess what? Pretty soon you're always running over and always running over. And now the client expects mm -hmm. their 60 minute session to be 75 minutes. Yep. So it's as simple as just popping in to say, okay, I know we're going to go over. I have extra time today. So I'm going to break mm -hmm. my own rule, right? Or it really feels like we need to wrap this up. Can we go an extra 15 minutes? So yep. this doesn't just apply to selling. It no. applies in customer service even more so. Yeah, because... The martyrdom of mart uh, the martyrdom of over marketing, yeah. and the martyrdom of yeah. over delivering are exactly mm -hmm. the same. Yeah, good right. Point. And and we want to do it for the client's benefit, but is the client really benefiting if all we're doing is depleting ourselves? I think not. Yeah. yeah. Right. I think not. So yours is the seventy five minute call. Mine is if somebody has a really big expo or something over the weekend then I'm going to say, listen, the second you get there, I want you to send a picture of your table so I can gush at it and be excited. And the second you're done with that expo, I want you to text me and tell you how it goes. And in doing that, you are violating my Saturday rule with permission. Yep. Great. You are violating my weekend rule with permission. Why am I giving that permission? I'm also tying it to, like you said, I have extra time today. Yeah, I'm saying you have a major event that you and I have been prepping for for months and I can't be there with you, but I am going to let you text me on a Saturday because I'm so excited and I just have to know what's going on. Yeah. That's right. That's and so it's example. it's again, I love that you said narrate the generosity, narrate the change, narrate the breaking of the rule, because of course we're going to have to break our own rules. Yeah, from time to time. I am 100% anti discount. But if someone comes to me in financial straits, I will work with them. But mm -hmm. I will tell them I'm breaking my own rule here to work with you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about manipulation. Cool. <laughs> manipulation. And I, I'm sorry for that weird. Like, no, it's like, perfect. It's so generosity it's, is yeah. such a beautiful goal. And it can be such a trap. Yeah. if we don't put boundaries around it to protect ourselves. But manipulation, sure. similarly, none of us who are listening to this podcast, and I don't think most coaches in general, wake up in the morning and go, I want to abuse someone today. <laughs> I want to force my will on someone for money today. Oh, joy, right? No, right. we're not happening. doing that. And if you're doing that, turn this podcast off and go find a therapist, y'all. Like, bleh. but... But one of the main things that we shy away from is helping our client feel what they need to feel. And so the way that that comes up is I don't want to be manipulative. Mm -hmm. Cool, but incorrect. If you love something experientially, if you are watching a show or reading a book or having a great conversation with a friend or listening to a really incredible speaker, the creator of that thing is manipulating the ever loving you know what out of you. Right. What I mean by that is they are manipulating you like clay. They are not trying to break you down. They are not trying to make you go somewhere you don't want to go. You have consented. You have signed on. But they need you in order to have the full experience to feel and think certain things. So Dallas, yeah. when was the last time you had a strong emotional reaction to a movie, a TV, a book, a song, anything? 
I just finished The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. And it's oh, one of my, okay. have you read it? Yes. Oh, okay. A hundred percent. Okay. Addie LaRue is a book all about world building and character building because it's got a lot of magic in it. Yep. Right. So in order to earn that, we have to suspend disbelief. In order to suspend disbelief, we have to have the world painted for us. We have to fall in love with the characters. If we don't fall in love with the world and we don't fall in love with the characters, then we're like, this is a really weird book about this woman who has this really weird life and I can't relate to it all and I'm just totally lost. Right? Yep. Mm -hmm. That's not what the author did. I just most recently watched the newest adaptation of Dune, and I've loved Dune since I was little, and I love the, the weird um, Kevin Lynch run, or David Lynch one. I love it. Love it. But I, uh, I watched the new one, and I didn't breathe the entire time. <laughs> I just realized at the end I was holding my breath because so much of it is like quiet and build up and everything that at the end of the movie, when the credits started, I went... Whew. Like yeah. audibly, I breathed and I went, I don't think I had a single breath that entire two hour span. That is because I voluntarily gave myself over to the magic of, of sci-fi and fantasy. Mm -hmm. And they rose to the occasion of taking me on a ride. The yeah. difference between that, which we all do when we sell, let me tell you about this possibility. Let me meet you where you are in terms of this pain point. Let me show you what's possible. Let me make you feel seen, safe, supported, comfortable, ready to tackle this challenge. If I'm getting you to those things, I'm priming the pump for you to help you get through the barriers that stand between you and those emotions. What I am not doing is leading you somewhere against your will. Yeah. And the example that I'm given all the time, and I'm biased against this because my grandpa was one. My grandpa was a used car salesman and he was a wonderful dude and everyone adored him. But that is the example of, I came on looking for a station wagon so I can safely drive my kids around. And somehow through duress, I left with this Ferrari, which is going right. to endanger my children and break down after two rides. Right. That is when someone leads you against your stated goal mm -hmm. toward whatever they want to sell you. Mm -hmm. That is not the only way to sell. So mm -hmm. if you are manipulating someone emotionally for their own benefit to help them go in the direction that they have told you explicitly, whether they're on a call with you or on your website and reading the dang thing, you are leading them toward the outcome they want with permission. Yeah. And whenever you feel like you might be hitting a nerve, guess what? Stop drop and ask for further permission that will totally get you out of any feeling of nastiness if you say listen i can't talk about the pleasure unless i talk about the pain do i have permission to ask you some sensitive questions that are really none of my business but with the purpose of seeing if we're a great fit right what, yeah. is, what is harmful about that nothing mm -hmm. we worry about manipulating because we worry about forcing yeah but if we're fostering emotion Mm -hmm. We are not making people choose what we want them to choose simply because we want them to choose it. Does that make sense, Dallas? It really does. And I think it's such a good point. And I want to remind our listeners that this is just about your own intentionality, right? Yes. So if you go into a sales conversation, I like to think of it this way, Annie. Am I self-centered or am I client-centered? Mm -hmm. So if you come into a sales conversation client centered, you're going to help them make the best decision for themselves. Yes. If you believe that the best decision for them is to work with you and to have that experience, you're going to make a case for that. If you're self centered, right, it's a totally different conversation. You're on your own agenda. You're not listening. And that's where manipulation comes in. And it's that same mm. liberation, freeing yourself from worrying about how you're going to force them into box A or box B. That's that same freedom when we drop the script. Yeah. Because when we drop the script and lean into what they need to feel in order to get to that decision making point, we learn about them differently. Mm -hmm. We connect with them on more levels and we can show up with more emotional safety for them, even yeah. if they're talking about scary things, because we're not gonna then sit around and go, hey, listen, I know we brought up a lot of sensitive feelings today, but if you buy in the next five minutes, <laughs> you'll say 9.99, like, whoa, yeah. right? Yep. So when we're showing up in that present 
client-centered, client-focused, and client-loving way, mm -hmm. we keep that client safe. Yeah. One other thing that's coming up for me as we speak is another mistake when we are self-centered mm -hmm. is that we actually don't make an offer. Yeah. What are they going to think of me? I oh. don't want to offend them. I don't want to manipulate. All of those fears are also self-centered fears. Yeah, that was that was me. Mm -hmm. So remember how yeah. we just talked about how I was the most sales avoidant person on the world? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I ran a free Facebook group for a really long time. It's an option. I have nothing bad to say about how other people run their groups, but let me tell you what I did wrong about mine hmm. when I was the world's most sales avoidant person. I was spending mm, 10, 15 hours a week of my work week in that room for free, yeah. not getting paid, delivering, 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 delivering. And I had the audacity every time I made a video in there to go, remember, this group isn't the Annie show, it's the us show. I want to hear from you. <laughs> Girl, what? Yeah. It was the Annie show. It should have been the Annie show. And if I would have just let it ethically and lovingly be the Annie show, mm -hmm. I would have made more money yeah. and they would have gotten better results. But instead, I always kept trying to take the spotlight away awesome. from me because mm -hmm. that's what felt right. But guess what? It's not about me. And I was making it about me by trying to not make it about me. Yep. It was right. So by saying it's not yep. the Annie show, I was making it weirdly the Annie show. And I was also <laughs> making people really uncomfortable about, well, wait, isn't she a strategist? And shouldn't I maybe invest in her? And couldn't she maybe help me do all these other things? Right. And so it's that was me. That yeah. was me 100 percent. But guess what? Your nerves on a sales call are not yours to focus on mm -hmm. and how you feel about selling in that moment is not yours to focus on you are there on that sales call to be present for the person on the other end of it so if you got to tell your emotions to go ahead and shut up for a little bit it's not about you how you feel about your pricing and whether or not you would pay your own pricing has no point on that call yeah, it's the so bad true. day you had that day, the fight you got into with your kids has no point on that call. The no you got on your last sales call has no role on that call, on your next sales call. Those are all ways that we make that experience about us mm -hmm. instead of realizing that we are being given the opportunity to connect with someone, solve a problem with them and for them, and deepen their understanding of what they need. If we make it about us, it falls flat. We stay in our emotions. We stay in our anxiety. We stay in that place of scarcity. And the client goes, wow, I, I really kind of expected them to be more confident. They didn't even offer me anything. Right. Or they may not even be aware of that. It'll be like, oh, wow, I feel great. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks so much. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we are both, uh, we love sales conversations. I thought it might be really fun for us to compare notes around our separate sales processes. Heck yeah. Love it. Let's do it. Great. So how do you start your sales conversations? Maybe we'll just go like beat by beat here a little bit. This is the only scripted part of my mm -hmm. entire sales call. And everyone out there, feel free to steal it. Great. The goal for this call is for us to learn about each other so that we can mutually decide if we're a good fit and should take this to another level. So the way that we're going to do that is I have questions about you, and I'm sure you have questions about me. Would you like to start with your questions or would you like me to start with mine? Great. What I'm so curious, what do people normally choose? It's 50-50. Is it? Yeah, that's great. It is. It And it, I think it also has a lot to do with like where they're coming in on the buy cycle. Because mm -hmm. if they've been hanging out on my mailing list for 45 years, then their questions for me are normally like, how's your dog? <laughs> right? Because they've been in my funnel, right? Yeah. Their questions for me are not, how do you deliver your work? They've been yeah. on my website. They've seen my emails, this or that. I bought into that. Mm -hmm. But if they're new to me, if they heard me on a podcast, or if they think that they're my first esthetician ever mm -hmm. then they're probably going to say well i have questions first first and foremost do you work with estheticians yeah 
right? Yeah. Um, so it, it varies a bit, but other people will just show up and be like, ooh, what do you want to know about me? Again, right. they are expecting to be word vomited on. Right. So the reason I do that like that is so that they know that they're not going to be. Yeah. Right? I give them permission thing. to take the lead at the beginning of the call. What do you do? Yeah, that is so smart because it also helps empty whatever like mental garbage mm -hmm. might be distracting the client from having a really connected conversation. If I'm sitting here the mm -hmm. whole time thinking, I wonder how much she charges. Yes. Right? Like, let's just get that out of the way yes. so that now we can connect. Okay. And so that does happen. That yeah. totally does happen. Sometimes I'll be like, do you? And and that's the risk you run when you open the door, when you just fling it open at yeah. the beginning. But I kind of really like it because there are some people who are purely price-based buyers and yep. that's 100% okay. So if I say, hey, at the very beginning, you want to have questions about me? They'll, and they, they always apologize for it. I hate to start it off like this, Annie, but I just got to ask if I want to work with you, are we talking hundreds, thousands more? And I right. say, listen, Everything is tailored based on the needs that you're going to express to me, but the majority of my stuff is a hundred bucks a month and it goes up from there. Does yeah. that work for you? Are you comfortable with that? I want to give you a more specific number, but I don't know what to offer you yet. Yeah. So that's how I handle it. If the very first thing out of their mouth is how much is this going to cost me? Yeah. And so for those of you listening, if you have, so I have a program that has a price. It's my one offer. Mm -hmm. So we're going to decide, are you a fit for the hive or not? Yep. If you, I actually tell people the price even before they get on the call. Yep. But if so do I. It's on my website. I'm just going to, I'm not going to pretend that I'm going to craft this offer and then tell mm -hmm. you the price because of the offer. That's not true. And mm -hmm. what we want to practice is honesty. So a hundred first, billion, billion percent. Yeah. yeah. I actually want to talk about the very first step that I take and it happens before the sales call. Oh, you I, going far back. Oh, Love yeah. it. Yeah. So I always assume the yes. Yes. And I learned this by accident, like way back when I, my first business that I started, I was 24 years old and people drove all the way to Westwood in Los Angeles. And for a lot of people, that was a drive. And I so mean, in, in Los mind, Angeles, everything is a drive. Completely, right? So I honestly believed you're not going to drive this far if you're not already a yes. That was, and maybe it was naive, maybe it was cocky, but that's really what I thought. And so, of course, I enrolled any person <laughs> who ever came because I, my, the whole call rested in this energy of it's already a yes. So that's where I begin. And then my process is exactly like yours, just setting the stage so that the client understands the agenda. Yes. I don't say it as explicitly as you as like, wh who do you want to go first? And I love your language around that. I will usually say like, here's what we're going to do. Do you have any questions before we get started? Um, but I love putting them again. In the you're like, seat. here's the agenda, yeah. but you're an active participant in this agenda. Do you need to declare anything before we go? Yeah, love it. Okay, amazing. So, and and about mm -hmm. assuming the yes. Oh please, oh please, everyone. <laughs> oh please. It's not even me saying it. It's Dallas saying it. If you don't take anything away from this, other than what Dallas just said. I listened to hundreds of calls when I was trying to get over my sales avoidance, mine, yeah. other people's, and I could always tell when the person assumed that they were going to get a sale, and I could always super duper 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 it's duper so tell obvious. when yeah. the person was assuming that they weren't going yeah. to get the sale. So if assuming that you will get the sale seems far away i want to encourage you to work toward that but by all means do not get on a sales call assuming that they're going to say no yeah yeah because the truth is you're going to go through the sales process anyhow and by assuming the yes you are just going to have more fun yes and the no you might be the one who says no yeah, totally. Okay, so what? So we've done that first phase where essentially we're getting consent. Yes. Right? What's the next step for you? Consent, permission. And then yeah. normally what I try to do uh, is I try to put them into a bucket by what problem they need solved and how. So mm -hmm. it's a little bit different. Like if you're saying if they're a hive person or they're not, mm -hmm. I have that to some degree. If they're coming in specifically asking about the membership, similarly, are they an academy student or not? 
Right. Right. But mm-hmm. if they're not, and I, and they didn't come for that, if they came to me for my secret menu of writing or consulting or some other thing, I need to start active listening to play Plinko. So the next thing I do, do you remember Plinko? Oh yeah. Okay. So for anybody out there who does not know what Plinko is on the price is right. There's this game that they play that looks like a bed of nails and a hockey puck and it's vertical and it's got buckets on the bottom. Play, play along, y'all. You put the <laughs> puck in the top, it bounces all around, seemingly erratically, and eventually lands in a bucket. Mm-hmm. The way I define those buckets are my offers, yep. right? So I'm listening for how much time do they have? How much energy do they have? How much handholding do they need? And most important, what problems do they need solved? Mm-hmm. Because then if I have something that has that time, that budget, that handholding and that problem solved built within it, then I know what to offer. So the next big chunk of my call is active listening and playing Plinko so I can make sure that if I do want to welcome them in, I'm welcoming them in with the right offer or if I only have one offer I'm still playing Plinko I just have two buckets which is the yes bucket or the no bucket and I'm paying attention so that when it comes time to make an offer I in power can choose to do that or to say hey listen I don't think we're a fit but I really loved your time today I hope it was helpful I hope I gave you some great stuff here's a piece of homework for you later yeah bye yeah. Right. Because then I could stand in power and do that. So that's yeah. what I do in that next chunk. What do you do? Yeah. I This for me is similar. It's an assessment phase. So this yes. is really asking open-ended coaching questions. And I want to find out, I, I'm pretty particular about the community that we've curated. So it's really mm-hmm. important for me to find out about you, the human, and what drives you and what your values are. So we have a values conversation and then I was like, what are your goals? What's standing in your way? And the question I ask more often than anything else is tell me more. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Yeah. Just because, and I, when I assess sales calls for me, you know, I think I'd love to hear your thoughts, but this should be about an 80, 20 ratio, them talking versus Mm -hmm. me talking, maybe even 90-10 in this phase in particular of the conversation. With the exception of painfully introverted clients or people who are in very active fear. Sometimes you're going to have to do a little more um, talk coaching Mm -hmm. than coach coaching Mm -hmm. to create that safe space. So, Mm -hmm. but even then I'd like that to be 30 to 40%, not more. Yeah. Um, unless again unless they need additional coaxing or unless they ask you to go into grand detail and it's part of your plan to do so for the right person in the right moment yeah. right but no 10 to 20 percent absolutely this is not an opportunity for you to just word vomit all over everybody like we said this is a chance for them to see if partnering with you whether that's eating a cupcake you made or signing up for your billion dollar mastermind. It's helping them, emboldening them, empowering them to choose whether you're right for them or not. Number one, they cannot choose if you're talking over them, cutting them off, not listening. And number two, they can't choose if they don't get a feel for you. So you got to talk a little, but more importantly, you got to listen. And yeah. also, I want to point out the fact that you said, you know, you're on your sales call, you're asking, you're asking your coaching questions. Hey, coaches, <laughs> a sales call, as mm-hmm. we talked about with boundaries, shouldn't be two hours long, shouldn't just give all your best stuff away for free. But yet, a sales call is a coaching conversation to get people to look at themselves in a productive way and understand that change and transformation are possible for them. Yep. If they do not come in with a deeper understanding of what is possible for them, then you are not coaching them well, you will not make the sale. And hey, coaches, similarly, a sales page is a coaching exercise. Mm-hmm. The person at the top of the page and the person at the bottom of the page should have a different understanding of who that person is than when they found you. Yeah, seems like a tall order, but it's not for coaches because that's what we do all that's day anyway. We do. You know what? I'm going to go next because you just set it up perfectly. The third phase of my process is actually coaching. I want, and this is where we have to, practice makes perfect, but 
I want you to really have the experience of what it's like to work with me. Yes. So we're going to begin moving toward, uh, we're, we're going to give you some traction. We're going to yes. coach around a specific obstacle that you face so that you actually know what you're buying into. Yeah. yeah. It's literally proof positive then. Yeah. Great. Especially if they are doubting their own ability or your own ability to bring something about. If I can show you how easy a quick win can be, and if I can facilitate that quick win, not only do I earn your trust to go deeper because you're mm -hmm. like, dang, she saw right through me, helped me through that problem in moments. I can only imagine what more access to her would feel like. Yeah, great. What about you? Same. Same, great. I always focus on the first problem that I can solve for that person. And that either comes up in listening where I'll ask something like, do you mind if I ask where you fall down on sales calls according to you? Right. And then I'll say something like, well, before we even get back into it, let me give you a little piece of language to try on your next call if you start to feel that same way. Yeah. Right. I had that this morning with a new client that found me. How much do I love this? Found me yesterday, got on my calendar today, hired me today. Quick start. Um, Quick start. That's how driven <laughs> she was. Right. But I asked her, I'm like, why are you so driven? This is amazing. Most people hang out on my list for longer. Why? And she shared with me that she had a really embarrassing, humiliating sales call. Yeah. And I said, do you mind telling me what happened on that really embarrassing, humiliating sales call? And she told me the very first thing I did was normalize the fact that we've all done that. I told her a story of where I had done something kind of equally mortifying and how I bounced back from it. And I said, but the next time you encounter that hurdle, I want you to think of this phrase. Mm -hmm. Right. She violated someone's boundary accidentally by asking too sensitive of a question. And so I just said, hey, yeah. hold on. Guess what? Next time, if you feel like you're treading on a nerve, then say, hey, listen, some uncomfortable feelings might come up here. If we need to stop at any point, you let me know. But I am going to push us a little deeper. OK. She went, oh, my God, that's so obvious. Why didn't I think of that, Annie? And I go, because no one's ever told it to you before. Yeah. But, oh, my God, that's so obvious, Annie. Why didn't I think of that before? The next time, and she did. She hired me on the spot. But mm -hmm. if she hadn't, which sometimes people can't because they need more time to think or to talk yeah. to their spouse or to get the money or whatever it may be, the next time she goes into a call, she's going to remember that thing that she learned with me. Mm-hmm. She's going to use it. She's going to get a win that way. Yep. But yes, I always do some form of coaching or teaching yep. on the call so that I can show them how good they are at sales. These yep. calls are not about showing them how good I am at sales. Obviously, they got a vet that I know what I'm talking about. I can't totally screw up, but it's better and more effective. And I will get the client more often if I can show them what they are capable of. Yeah, that's great. Before I ask them for a dime. Yeah. It's at this point that I transition into the invitation. Do you yep. at this? Yep. Great. Yep. Yeah. And, so and the way that I do the, that. Yeah. I want to know also about the one call close. Like what's your position on the one call close? I don't mind it for the right person, but I don't recommend it for all people. Same. Yeah. I actually think taking the pressure or the belief that if I don't close them on the call, something's wrong or broken mm -hmm. allows you to present an invitation like more purely and actually probably convert at a higher rate when you stop trying so hard. Okay. So I give homework every yeah. single time. Yeah. Yep. Whether they become my client on the call or not, I give homework every single time. And it's yeah. because of what I just said, right? I want them to get that quick win. Mm -hmm. If they just paid me, I want them to get a quick win so that they don't get buyer's remorse. Yeah. Smart. If they haven't paid me yet, I want them to go do their homework so they can prove the point and go, damn, she does know what she's talking about. I should hire her. Yeah. So or smart. you know what? Annie was right. This is way easier. Annie mm -hmm. was right means I'm going to pay Annie. <laughs> right? It yeah. Right yes, me. Annie. So, yeah. so in terms of today, that call was a one call close. She mm -hmm. closed on the call. Awesome. Fantastic. I have people that hang out on my list for years. Mm -hmm. It's not ideal, but it happens. And if I forced every single one of them into an immediate answer, the immediate answer I would get would be no. So instead, I say, if I get a maybe or a not now, or a let me talk to my so-and-so, or an objection that cannot be handled on that call, especially with other deciders involved, then I say, okay, cool. Let's set a time to follow up. I set that time. I put it in my calendar on the call with the person. And I say, in the meantime, here's what I'm going to do. 
And here's what I want you to do. Your homework from me is yeah. whatever that homework is. Yeah. Try this. And then I time. follow up as mm -hmm. promised because I told him I would. And the first thing I do when I ask them how they are is I ask them if they did their homework, which also shows me if they're serious about this work or not. Because or if not. I give you easy homework and you don't do it, then you're probably the same kind of person that's going to come into my program and never open it. Yeah. And I would rather not have those clients and not make that money. And I'm lucky enough in this position of my business that now I can be choosy and go, if you're not going to do the work, I don't want you in here. Yeah. Yeah. So makes sense. It really does. What I'm hearing you say is as the call comes to a close, you've played Plinko. So you're clear on what, if any, offer to present. Yes. You present the offer. How do you, like, what's the act? And it's, it's always Here's a little different. Easiest but give us the tip here. Here we go, y'all. Mm -hmm. Easiest offer ever. If you've answered questions like we talked about and we've played Plinko like we talked about, whether you have one service and it's yes, no, or whether you have many and it's the buckets, the phrasing is exactly the same, which is, <clears throat> based on what you just told me about X, mm -hmm. and in that X, you put their statement, their, their words, words, the yeah. problem as they understand it, the goal or dream as they understand it, the hurdles in between, and what you've learned about their specific needs, like we talked about, budget, time, hand-holding, right? So based on what you just told me, I'll use this client this morning, based on what you just told me about how afraid you are to have another bad call and how lovely your boss has been, but how important it is for you not to let her down, I want you to get into the academy immediately so I can start working with you now. Yeah. Based on what you just told me about how hard it is for you to attend courses or course calls because you have 97 children, I don't think you should go into my membership. I think we should just have a one on one when it works for your schedule, because otherwise we're trying to fit you into something that might not work for you. Based on what you just told me about X, Y, and Z, what I want to offer you is A, B, and C. And mm -hmm. the very literal connective obvious tissue that seems obvious, but let me say it again, the reason for that is one, two, and three, right? Yep. Based on what you just told me about your life, I want to offer you this thing because here's the connective tissue and the price for that is. Yep. And then you say the price and here's the most important part, Dallas. You ready? I think I know what it is. Hit me. Shut up. <laughs> Shut yeah. up. Once you say the price, what I always do is I put it back on them and I go, is that about what you were planning to spend or how does that land on you? Or do you understand why that's the price I charge or any question I want to ask what I say? And the price for that is a hundred bucks a month. Does that make sense to you? And then I shut up. Yep. Yeah, this is important for a million reasons, but one of them is we have to give the client the dignity of their own process. Oh, so for heaven's sake, jump yes. into here's how many calls and here's that, 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 and Voxer this and worksheets that you are robbing them of this, the experience of making an empowered decision. Yes. So, yeah, that's And if they want to know the nuts and bolts. They'll ask. Then they'll ask you for them right at the very beginning. Or once you've made the offer, they'll go, okay, it's a hundred bucks a month. Now I need an itemized list of everything I get for that. Cool. Yep. Then you know what's important and you can proceed. Mm -hmm. Right. But they're saying, I don't have enough information to make this decision yet. Right. So if someone came to my table at a restaurant and said, today our special is the chicken and just walked away, I'm going to be like, well, why is the chicken special? What's up with the chicken? What's on the chicken? I have so many questions about these chickens. Right. Mm -hmm. Similarly, though, if that same waiter or waitress or person came up to me at the restaurant and said, our special today is the chicken. They gave me every single detail on the chicken and then they wouldn't shut up about the chicken. And then they just go on and on and on and on about the entire lineage of this chicken and the source of every single ingredient and the chef and why the chef likes to combine those things and also every ingredient that's not there every allergen that i should be aware of and everything else and doesn't stop talking and then at the end they go so what do you want to eat for dinner i'm gonna go well i guess i'm having the chicken because you're shoving it down my damn throat and i guess it doesn't have blue cheese and i'm allergic to that so let's just wing it and hope that this is what i wanted yeah. you're not honoring my process you're also not honoring my desire or need very human need to make a decision 
yeah. with intention. Yeah. Yeah. You know what's cool is we've we use essentially the same framework, right? But yeah, yeah, we, yeah, yeah. I know, right? Uh, but we are two very different people. And so the way we host those calls or follow that framework is just so very different. So I hope that was fun for our listeners to I love that. Let it be to. different. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And I'm also, not going to say no script and then be like, by all means, follow me to the freaking letter. <laughs> what's important is how we make people feel. Yeah. What's important is how we explain the value that we provide and the process of what we do. What's important is how we show up to advocate for the problems that we solve and show people what's possible. There are many roads to get there. Yeah, completely. Great. Amen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on the show today. That was a really enlivening conversation. It was so cool to have you. It has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for letting me rant about sales. Of course. If people have questions, where should they reach out? Hey, listen, if you're in an education info crack place and you just want to nom it all up, then by all means, go over to my website, AnniePRuggles.com. Mm -hmm. But I need you to do me a favor, listener, which is if you are in active sales avoidance, meaning you have something coming up and you are freaked out, you have an expo, a call, your emails are going out and you are shaken in your boots. I want you to message me on a platform with messaging. The best two for me are Instagram and LinkedIn. On Instagram, you can find me at Anniepreneur. On LinkedIn, you just search for my name. Tell me what you're up against. Let me do what I said on this very call, which is show you that quick win so Great. you can see how easy selling can be. I would be honored to help take that fear away. Uh, thank you. That's awesome. So generous. All right. I could keep going, but I think we've we've really left people with we'll a lot of We'll keep going when you're on my show. I know, right? I'm going to come on your show. Great. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. We'll see you back here next week.